Welcome to another AP Psychology Review video. This video review is designed to basically help in learning some of the more obscure or random or less likely terms to show up on the AP exam, but terms that are still possible. So I would say that if you are looking for general studying, this is not the video that you want to start with first. This would be something to check out when you are feeling confident in most of the vocabulary associated with AP Psychology but maybe not necessarily some of the more out there things. With that being said, I want to show you some terms that have the same meaning, but they may not be referred to the same way. So they have a few different ways of referring to some of these things based on the textbook that your AP Psychology class is probably using. So I'm not going to go over these just in the interest of time, but you can reference this slide to basically see how some terms are referenced in one text versus another. For example, Yerkes Dodson Law is pretty common, but so is the inverted U hypothesis. So it really is just going to depend on the author of your textbook and what they are using. One of the first obscure terms that is out there, but may or may not wind up on the AP exam, is something known as the framing effect. And this is a type of cognitive bias where you react to a certain choice based on the way it's presented to you. So for example, if people are given the option to choose between 200 people will be saved in treatment A versus a one-third probability of saving all 600 lives and a two-thirds probability of saving no one in treatment B, the people were generally swayed to choose treatment A. Positive framing is uh, very influential and usually the best case scenario for marketing and advertisements. In negative framing, if people are given an option of choosing between 400 people die or a one-third probability that no one will die and a two-thirds probability that 600 people will die, both of those things are referring to the same thing, but now this time people actually choose treatment B. So again, positive framing, people generally chose A. Negative framing, more of the people chose treatment B. Two other terms are uh, belief perseverance and token economy. Belief perseverance is when you have a desire to continue believing in something, even when it has been disproven to you. Usually with belief perseverance, once you have been uh, shown evidence that is your disproof, you may actually become more stubborn or more tenaciously trying to defend your beliefs. In this case, you have a sl uh, snail who says, I don't care if she is a tape dispenser, I love her. So maybe this snail realized from the other snail that's a tape dispenser, but they still love the tape dispenser. With the token economy, it is a type of behavior modification based on operant conditioning. And the main idea is to try to encourage behavior. So this is used sometimes for young children, uh, senior citizens, and also people who deal with a lot of social anxiety. The idea is basically if you have a group therapy where people have lots of social anxiety, to encourage participation, you give them some type of reward. This is basically the token. Later at the end of the sessions, then they exchange that token for some type of reward. They're working towards free time or uh, something in particular. That's the token economy. Uh, other terms are called self-handicapping and intrinsic drift. Self-handicapping is when you avoid effort in the hopes of keeping your potential failure from hurting your self-esteem. So really, you're trying to protect your self-esteem. In this example, you can look at the cartoon. A golfer is asking some other golfers what their handicaps are, and they are giving some excuses. Another example of self-handicapping may be if you are in AP Psychology class, but you are worried about how you're going to do. Instead of actually trying, you just sort of give up and you show up to class, but you never do anything. So in the end, if you end up failing, you can say that, well, you never gave any effort and thus your self-esteem is protected. With intrinsic drift, it is about animals who are going to revert back to their instinctive or more natural behaviors, which can interfere with behaviors that they have been trained to do. So while you may train your dog to show some cute trick-like behavior, it's possible that over time this fades and they will revert back to their species-specific behaviors, which are probably not ones that you trained. You also have the just world hypothesis and biofeedback. The just world hypothesis is assuming that the world is fair and people are going to either get what they deserve or deserve what they get. Biofeedback is a process to try to gain awareness over your autonomic nervous system and basically have some awareness of what is going on when you experience any changes and hopefully gain some willpower to actually control it or manipulate it at will. There's a picture here of a guy who ha is hooked up to a biofeedback machine and he's basically monitoring his autonomic nervous system. Some other terms that you have are habituation, which you can see is a decrease in response to a stimulus after repeated presentations. 
For this, what I would say is maybe you're trying to go to sleep at night, but your neighbor is constantly blasting loud music. If you start getting used to that environment, to your habitat, or you start getting used to the loud music and eventually can fall asleep, it's no longer really bothering you, then your response is showing habituation. The overjustification effect is going to state if you suddenly start being rewarded for something that you already like doing, you may actually start to like you may actually start to like it less. So if you're really intrinsically motivated for something that you then receive an extrinsic motivation for or some type of incentive, you may actually start to not enjoy that behavior. And then there is another term, as you're probably noticing, some of these terms are dealing with uh, learning behaviors. Another one is called imprinting. And imprinting is basically when you learn a specific response at a specific age or a particular uh, stage of life that is rapid and apparently independent of the consequences of behavior. The main example of this that you could possibly see for AP Psychology would be the psychologist Conrad Lentz studying gray lag geese. Basically, as soon as these geese are born in their, uh, hatched from their eggs, they are going to imprint some of the first things that they see. In this case, it's movement from Conrad, and they fix on to his boots. And when they see them moving around, they start to follow him. So this is their imprinting. You can see in the pictures the geese following around Conrad Lentz. Other uh, less common terms are here. You have state-dependent memory, mood congruent memory, human factors, I.O. psychology, and vestibular sense or semicircular canals. So the state-dependent memory is going to refer to memories that are most efficiently retrieved when they are in the state of mind as their formation. So this is typically related with people who are on hallucinogens or on alcohol and in a certain state of mind, a certain state of consciousness when they make those memories, that's how they can probably remember them later on if they use them again. Mood congruent memory is going to refer to a memory process that says your memories are best retrieved when they match your mood. And so if you make certain memories under a specific mood, later on when you have that same mood, you may actually recall those memories. Human factors is a type of um, optimization of human health and systems. And so human factors are going to basically look at things like ergonomics, maybe making a keyboard that has a pad on it to overall help your efficiency or protect your hands. I.O. psychology is known as industrial organizational psychology. And uh, this is a pretty rising field. There are lots of jobs available in this now. But it deals a lot with human behavior in the workplace. So looking at a lot of HR related issues. Um, and then you have a vestibular sense or semicircular canals. Basically with this, the vestibular sense is all about your balance state of equilibrium. And this is going to be mostly controlled from the semicircular canals, which are deep in your inner ear uh, above the chambers of the cochlea. And then finally, I'm going to leave you with a few slides on what I'll call this or that. So there are a couple of things that are kind of one or the other. So you have antisocial behaviors, which are behaviors that lack consideration for others, or they may cause damage to the society, whether intentionally or through negligence. And then you have the opposite, prosocial behavior, which is more about behaviors that help other people, even if that means you are doing it out of selflessness or for the self-serving bias. You also have two types of exposure therapies here called flooding and implosive therapy. Flooding is going to actually uh, be very similar to implosive therapy. They're both designed to expose clients to things that cause them anxiety and it's going to be for a pretty prolonged duration. The goal here is with flooding, it is dealing with actual images or stimuli. So you're really going to experience it. However, with implosive therapy, this is going to be imagined, so there's not going to be any direct contact. If you were to have flooding used on you, you may have a fear of snakes. To get over this fear, you're going to be exposed to a large amount of snakes in a room with you at once. And so the idea is that if you are flooded with the fear, you're going to have to get over it. That's flooding. You also have the actor-observer effect or bias, the fundamental attribution error, and the self-serving bias. There's a chart here which has the three differences, but basically fundamental attribution error is the tendency to overestimate the impact of dispositional causes on others' behavior. So you may commit this in a situation where you are uh, ascribing whatever is happening to someone's personality as opposed to saying that it is based on the situation or an environmental effects. You may 
commit the actor observer effect if you are showing a tendency to attribute your own behaviors mainly to environmental effects. You ascribe them to situational causes as opposed to internal personality uh, traits or feelings or abilities. And then finally, the self-serving bias is when you have a tendency to attribute our positive outcomes to your internal attributions. These will be things like your personality trait or your abilities or your feelings, but then negative outcomes to external causes. Maybe it is the task difficulty, chance, something in the environment. You have divergent thinking and convergent thinking. Divergent thinking is about taking some idea, some object, and expanding upon that. So uh, maybe a use of object test. This is a screwdriver. What kind of uses can you use with the screwdriver? It can serve as a pendulum. It can serve as a screwdriver to screw in a screw. Convergent thinking, on the other hand, is when you bring information in to produce a single correct answer. You're converging upon the topic or you're converging upon the answer. This is sometimes a strategy you will use for multiple choice questions when you kind of know an answer, so you're making an educated guess, and you're going to use elimination or convergent thinking to find out the correct answer. You have two other more out there terms. I would find it unlikely these show up on the AP exam, but it could be possible. So these are going to refer to either your life instincts or anything dealing with the preservation of life or death instincts or something attributed to why people may engage in a risky behavior. Those terms are eros or thanatos. And that is the end. So I hope that you will find some benefit in looking at more of this high level review. If you have any questions, please feel free to leave them in the comment and I'll do my best to get back to you. All right, thanks.